Um, I'm very pleased um, now that we're all assembled um, to uh, welcome to uh, our first presentation um, uh, Helen Gunter. Um, Helen is um, a long uh, serving and uh, highly respected uh, colleague in Belmas. She was on the um, Council of Belmas uh, for, for a, a good time. I won't say it long or anything like that, but a good time. And um, uh, she is now at a professor in, in Manchester University after a very successful period here in Birmingham. Um, but she is uh, known and publishes. I'm a huge list of publications. I mean, you, you don't don't press the print um, <laughs> button on on on, on, uh, on uh, Helen's publications. Um, she she is she is um, uh, deeply reflective, um, <coughs> boldly critical. Uh, and in the best academic tradition, uh, she nevertheless holds firm to her practitioner roots as a teacher. And she's always arguing uh, that practitioner academic is, is, a, is a difficult thing to uh, uh, distinguish. Um, I would like to, I'm, I'm going to find it difficult to stop her, uh, so I'm going to invite her to come up. Uh, uh, Helen Gunter, the enfant terrible uh, of Belmas. <laughs> Well, good morning, colleagues. Follow that. <laughs> um, thank you very much for um, your, your introduction, um, uh, David, and for um, uh, helping me with the latter part of my talk, I think. Uh, I, hopefully, I'll be able to make the connections. Uh, good morning, colleagues, and um, happy anniversary to Belmas. Uh, I've been asked to speak about the relationship between the past and the present. And I'm going to start with a quiz, and I, I will try and make it as exciting as pointless, but I doubt it very much. <laughs> I'm going to begin by talking about various perspectives in relation to our field. So I've selected two quotations, and when I've looked at the printed text in your packs, they are a bit tiny. So if you want copies of my slides, then please, please do ask. But here I've got um, a quotation from a head teacher. Perhaps the most, and I'll read it out in case uh, it's too small there at the back. Perhaps the most important problem of all, which faces ahead, is how to arrive at school with a smile, keep it all day, still have it when he gets home, and then asleep soundly when he goes to bed at night. Would we like to put a date on that? Anybody? This is the pointless bit. 1924, Peter. Good morning, Peter. 1924. No. 1980s. 74. Oh, we're getting warmer. Yeah, it's 1976. It's Colgate in Peter's collection of um, head teacher stories. The next one is a researcher, and there'll be people in this room who will know this one. Um, that the field is concerned with the acquisition, control and distribution within a school system of scarce educational resources, a term that includes status and rewards as well as buildings and books. The processes involved, decision making, communicating, evaluating, supervising and so on, a characteristic of, insert your own word, behaviour in organisations of all kinds at all levels, and as such they require description, analysis and conceptual refinement. Anybody like to put a date on that? 2008. Well, that's a good one, 2008. Cold on that one. Super <laughs> cold. Late 1980s. No, keep going further back. 1964. 69, yeah, it's Bill Taylor, yeah? And where I took out um, label, it said administrative. But you could put in their management leadership, I think, yeah? Um, so what um, is, is interesting about these quotes is I think it raises for us questions regarding the relationship between the present and the past. Because you can read certain texts and wonder whether or not it is 30 years ago, 20 years ago, or currently. And certainly I think that there are the things in these texts that continue to resonate today. So the intensification of work, I think that that head teacher there in 1976 is speaking to that sense of uh, the intensification that I think school leaders today would recognise. 
Also the sense that you've got to keep everything going with a smile um, in spite of what's happening. There's a sense in which as you do your job, and I'm doing the ref at the moment and I spend most of my life smiling, so walking around the building. So that sense, if you like, of trying to keep everything uh, together, but the sense that, you know, can you switch off when you go to bed at night? I think that, again, is an important issue. And then I think from Bill Taylor, the fact that you've got the activities listed there that are very, very relevant to us today. But the question is, what do you actually call it? You know, do you call it administration, management, leadership, and so on? Um, but I think even though it resonates today, there are important questions to ask. You know, what are we making decisions about? What are we smiling about? Are we doing it around privatisation? Are we doing it around the curriculum? What are the purposes of education? I think that there are distinctive things that we have to focus on regarding today and not get not too nostalgic, if you like, regarding um, the past. So the questions, that's the quiz over for a moment. You can relax. The questions that I want to raise here is not so much whether or not we need history. I think that that is quite obvious. And uh, if, you, if you are not convinced on that, then I think that you need to look at Peter Ribbin's guest edited issue of JEH in 2006 that I think makes the case and reminds us of the importance of history. And of course, there is historical work within our field. We had an example of it uh, in the introduction. We've got Peter's um, work with various collaborators on educational professionals and the importance of biographical interviews. Peter's work with Brian on policymakers and civil servants that we'll hear about later today. Um, Richard Hatcher and I wrote a conference on Saturday where Peter Downs, who of course was very important in LFM um, in the 1980s in Cambridgeshire, uh, gave a talk on fair funding and again historically had to go back and trace issues around funding regimes. And Bernard Barker in his book The Pendulum Swings relates performance management today with performance um, payment by results. And then, of course, the other advert, I've already made it once, but I will do again, is for the Journal of Educational Administration and History, where we publish historical accounts of educational administration. And currently, we're seeing quite a big plethora of books that are coming out that are telling the stories of new labor, whether or not that's biographical work from the people involved in policy, the most recent one being Andrew Adonis's book, or whether or not we're looking at um, research-based books, and Richard Pring's book about secondary education for all question mark uh, is, is recently out. So we're getting a sense, if you like, that contemporary histories um, uh, are being written. However, as Peter reminded us in, in 2006, uh, 2006 um, about historical work, that the study of administration in, in education is important, that enabling this requires an understanding of knowledge production, that history is crucial to such knowledge production, and there's good reason to suppose that history has not been and is not being given the attention it merits in our field. Uh, and I think that was a point that was well made, and I think it is still the case today. So I want to raise a number of questions uh, to get us thinking about history. And the first question I'd like to raise is what histories do we want uh, to construct and how do, they want, how do we want them to be useful to us? Now in doing that, I think what I'm really saying is that the methodologies and methods that we use in historical work are of course deeply inflected with power structures and processes. And so in a post-colonial world, how do we give recognition to resources that construct histories uh, differently? So do we go to the United States for our models, um, for practice? Or, as Michael Apple has argued, do we go south? Do we go to Brazil and Porto Alegre for the way in which schools and education are organized? Um, do we go to the US for theories of leadership? Or do we go to France for our social science? Or, as um, Ray Wynne Connell has argued, do we go south in southern theory for our conceptual tools? 
And to hit the point home, I'd like to suggest that if you read anything at all this weekend, that you get off your shelves the 1999 book from the ESRC seminar series that was edited by Bush, Bell, Bolam, Glatter and Ribbins. Because in there, there is a gem of a chapter by Valerie Hall. And I think that she helps us think very, very carefully and interestingly and continues to resonate about issues that are important for our field. She uses the metaphor of separate tables to challenge the field. Women study gender usually through the, the, the barriers to women and not men, and men don't recognize that gender is an issue. And she basically says that we need to challenge the taken for grantedness of gender, and, in, and of course the intersectionality with issues of class, race, and sexuality. And importantly, she, re she illuminates the position of the issue as a separate chapter. Uh, she's a separate chapter in the book rather than the fact that it pervades the book. And it's only when all chapters in an edited collection begin on the basis that educational administration is taking place in an unjust world might we actually start to get scholarship that challenges the realities and thinking about everyday life. So for me, the kind of histories that we need to be thinking about are the ones that don't replicate social injustice in our world. The second question I want to raise is who writes those histories? Well, as already said, there are a few of us about, but if we're to stop being at separate tables, it does need to permeate uh, the field. It seems as if sometimes that the field has accepted the remit and requirements of commission funding, particularly in the last 10, 15 years, where of course historical work doesn't usually feature. If it's done, very often it tends to be based on fabricated past that leads to inevitabilities um, uh, that you're required as a deliverer to do. And it seems to me that historical work needs to be generated through how we set and contribute to our own agendas, through doctoral studies, uh, through uh, research funding from research councils and charities and so on, through innovative methodologies such as ethnographies that link to bigger picture analysis and through illuminative descriptions and conceptualizations. But in the meantime, it seems to me that journalists may be taking um, the lead from us. And I'm here, I'm thinking of Francis Beckett's book on, on academies, um, which I think was an important statement to our field. And this is in contrast, say, to biographies such as uh, Andrew O'Donis' recent book, where the dangers of selective memory and a lack of scholarly engagement with evidence is really very obvious. So the question is, how do we in the field respond to this rush of biographical work? And how are we writing our field? Or are we allowing other people to write our histories for us? So I think that we need to ask, who are the authors of our field histories? And as much of our history is elite history, we might ask how we might demonstrate histories through work with children, parents, and communities. And I certainly think that Michael Wood's recent histories of England based in communities, particularly the one on Kebworth, I think was an excellent model for us to think about. Question three is how do we tell those histories? I think that we live our lives through stories, stories of children and how we've enabled them to learn, colleagues we've worked with, events in our private lives, whether they're positive ones like getting married or negative ones such as bereavement and so on. And in thinking about stories, I'm reminded of Carolyn Stedman's book on archives called Dust. Uh, and I'm deeply um, indebted to my colleague, colleague Colin Mills who passed me this book. It's a really fascinating book that I found uh, spoke to me um, in, in interesting ways. And it seems to me that archives and our stories about archives and history are the stuff of history, um, as in the narrating of history does not exist until we speak it into existence. Stegman argues that there is a double nothingness in the writing of history. It's about something that never did happen in the way it comes to be represented, and it's made out of materials that aren't really there. So in approaching histories in educational administration, I think we need to ask questions about how we codify, and following on from Valerie Hall, how we position ourselves, which tables we are going to be sat at. And the fourth and final question I'd like us to think about is how do we interplay the present with the past and the future? 
regarding the human condition. Now, as some of you know, I've just finished writing a book on using Anna Arendt's methodologies and ideas to raise crit critical questions about the field. And I think that there are two things that I would raise from that analysis. The first one is Anna Arendt uses a metaphor called thinking without a banister. And I think it's an important metaphor and one that I keep playing with. Um, and I think it's essential for our field, and certainly if we're going to construct and write histories and think about histories, I think it's very important. And what she means is that much of the time, we seek security and stability. We're stood on the stairs going up and down, and we hang on uh, for dear life. And much of us, many of us, run up and down stairs quite easily. Watching my father now at the age of 87, uh, I, you know, I can see how challenging the stairs are. And perhaps I'm thinking of that metaphor that I ought to think about how challenging they ought to be intellectually. In other words, if we take the banisters away, then we might be able to think uh, much more creatively about our field and where we're going. And so in doing that, um, um, Arendt's work is incredibly challenging around totalitarianism and the conditions for totalitarianism. She argues they're with us all the time, and the question is how they crystallize. She looks at issues of lying, and I found it very interesting reading ministerial speeches and identifying the big whoppers. <laughs> also, what I've come to call the banality of leadership through using her analysis of the Nazis and asking questions about desk murderers, that is, when we're at a time of austerity and people are being made redundant, and I have to say the universities are not immune from this, the question is in what ways we are surplus. And certainly, um, Mrs. Thatcher made sure that historical work in schools of education was deemed surplus when it was removed from teacher training. And I think that we've got issues here around the, uh, the irrelevance of people like me. Yeah? And I want to say I am not surplus to requirements. The other aspect that I think she's interested on is the distinction between labour, work and action. She talks about labour as being the things that you do to survive, food and so on, work around craft and creating something that will outlast our mortality, and action which is political and engaging in debates. And she argues that much of our activity has become labour and we only have to look at audit the audit culture to realize that many of us have stopped acting and talking uh, on the basis of form filling so that's just a little advert if you like for what's coming um, in, in in next year but i do think thinking without a banister is really helpful for our historical work i think the second thing that she raises is that we should not conflate events even if they look to be similar so she, it, it is argued, using Anna Arendt's work, because she was already dead at the time, that 9-11 is not the same as Pearl Harbor, even though the media in, in the US made out that it was. While comparisons can be made, we need to focus on what's distinctive. So um, the, the kind of attack on the US is the same idea, but 9-11 is a different sort of event than Pearl Harbor. So this morning, what I'd like to do is think without a banister and raise some questions about the field and how we might do um, productive um, uh, histories. So I've recently uh, tried to put a history together of um, uh, educational administration uh, for the British Journal of Educational Studies. And I kind of came up with five Ps uh, because I wanted to use bullet points because, as you know, I really love bullet points. Um, that production, what I'm getting at here is when we come to write histories, I think that we've got to think about knowledge production um, and that the field is pluralistic. But when you actually look at the historical development of the field, it's actually become a drive towards a kind of reinvented theory movement of trying to get the one best way for what works in spite of the pluralism that goes on in practice and within research. Um, and while things like socially critical work remains vibrant, and we, we've got a research interest group around critical um, educational policy and leadership, you wouldn't think so that it was that vibrant when you actually look at uh, the texts and the way in which people are trained. 
So I think we need to ask questions about the knowledge of the field when we look historically regarding who's produced what's there, under what conditions, and in particular, who funds it. I would then want to move on to pro uh, production processes. And historically, when you read um, the way in which the fields developed its knowledge, there, there is a tradition of, of borrowing. Um, and that word is used a lot in the, in the text when you go back in time. And again, the borrowing idea has been captured by the functional approaches. And then when we look at positions, where knowledge workers take up positions, it seems to me that the functional borrowers take up a translation and delivery position, whereby the issue is that uh, knowledge is produced elsewhere, particularly in the private sector, and our job is to borrow, translate, and deliver. Whereas uh, socially critical work tends to be much more activist and is concerned with broader transformational issues. And then when you look at purposes, if you study the new Labour government that I think it governments that I think is rapidly becoming my historical period, when you look at the interplay between knowledge workers within and external to government, it seems that functionality with borrowing and translation and delivery seems to dominate within policy making. And then when you look at practices, whereby you look at, say, the new labour policy regime, as I call it, that again was functional, located in borrowed ideas, which translated and delivered as a means of modernising education. And I have to say, there isn't much different uh, as we've gone over the, uh, the watershed. But external to that is field pluralism, where there, there are policy researchers who use historical work and try to use ideas to think, but also to support activism. So in that kind of quick whiz through, where I would want to argue that these are important features for how we write our histories, I think this provides a challenge to the field about the, the way in which we go about it. So I want to say something now about the challenges to answering the questions I've posed and the challenges to engaging in production through to practices and the kinds of histories we want to write. And I think that there are a number of challenges. It could well be three, if I recall. The first one is, and this tells you how I spend my spare time. Um, the first one is, is I want to make the case that there is an over-reliance on functionality. And I want to use CSI as a metaphor. I love CSI, I watch all of them. More often than not, I watch the repeats. So there's, there's something there. But for me, the emphasis is on what works. And when you watch CSI, it speaks to us culturally in the way in which we are moving forward. There's an emphasis in our field on policy science regarding delivery and policy entrepreneurship regarding pro product development and sales rather than understanding the realities of practice. It seems as if data, or rather the demand for and the process for collection and analysis, sets the agenda, rather than the relationship between professional practice and the big issues for our communities. This tends to lead to a focus on the collection of evidence as data with causal relations made. For example, if you get the right type of leader in place, then, then improvement will take place. Those sorts of statements uh, are often made. And when you watch CSI, that's exactly what it's about. And increasingly, it's become described as procedural acting. So next time you watch it, notice how many times they talk through procedures and they do procedural acting and procedural practice. And it seems to me that within our field, there is too much dominance by procedural practice, following rules, um, and so on. And so, just as CSI focuses on crime, we focused on crime in education, which of course is failure. So teachers fail, children fail, schools fail, parents fail, academics fail. Um, and there's a great document, and if, you can get, if you've not got it, then, then get hold of it. I think it illustrates it nicely from what was the DFES called Smoking Out Under Achievement. That's a great title. 
And when you watch CSI and when you look at the, the last 10, 15 years, data matters, but schools are awash with it, and much of it's fabricated in schools. And it seems to me that the field has adopted the neoliberal position um, that comes, that's illustrated in CSI. If you watch CSI, particularly Miami, they're constantly making the point that the people that they've arrested have made bad choices in their lives. That's why they've ended up murdering someone. And it seems to me that we as viewers are meant to look upon this and make sure that we don't engage in such foolish behaviour. I certainly think that Ofsted and other data collection agencies are trying to enable the profession to look on others and look on schools and make sure um, that the lesson must be learned. So I think that there's an over-reliance on functionality and we don't want histories um, that are uh, functional. I think the second issue um, looking at our field is there's too much emphasis on heroes and villains. Now, quite frankly, Piers Brosnan can come and rescue me any time. Um, but I do think that there are problems here regarding the emphasis on elites. And there are always elite villains as well, which is interesting. What we've seen in the last 10, 20 years is the writing of salvation narratives by people in, in, in um, um, the, the field, the sense that heads writing about how they've turned a school around or how this particular strategy will solve your problem. And it seems as if the emphasis is on the charismatic hero, um, the Secretary of State, the Director of the National College, charismatic heads, and the evil villain, whether or not that's me as the enfant terrible, teacher unions, parents who come to school in their pajamas, the whole raft of people who are villainized. And they must be defeated or shown the errors of their ways. And certainly this creates a form of passivity. And importantly, it seems to me that what we're seeing is that when we used to watch the old Star Treks, do you remember there was always somebody in a red shirt who you knew as soon as they beamed to a surface, they'd get killed. They would be the one who'd get killed. Yeah, And it seems to me um, that that sort of person, as soon as you see them and they're showing battle, they know that they're going to be killed. They're superfluous to the drama. And at a time of privatisation and cuts, it seems to me that we're all superfluous. However, we do have histories that show the excellent work that's being done by ordinary people doing a really good job, much of which is invisible. And I have to say, a lot of practitioners want to keep it that way because it's damn dangerous to get onto certain people's radars. And the third one I have talked about before, and I've written about this one with Pat Thompson. Trini's, Trini and Susanna could not write the history of our field, uh, but many of those Trini and Susannas uh, are thriving. And they're thriving in the name of agency, the sense that we're giving rules. And I followed them today. I'm wearing my lipstick, and I'm wearing a V-neck top. That is Trini and Susanna's rules for being a credible woman in the modern world. So we're given rules for our everyday lives, which structure in ways that are deterministic. And beware of leadership makeovers. When you read through that, substitute Trini and Susanna for Ofsted. We get a glimpse of Trini and Susanna's world, but in reality, we can never enter because there are issues of status, links to the royal family, and issues to do with income. Not least because the women who are the beneficiaries of, of a makeover are usually poor, and so they may now have the rules of taste given to them, but they may not have the income to access and sustain it. For me, this is evident not just in the audit culture processes, but in the language that's accepted. And we might want to consider whether or not the move from administration to management to leadership to social entrepreneurship, it seems to be the buzzing phrase, is, is actually a, a makeover. What do we want our practice to be and what do we want to call it? There has been the use of communication methods that close down opportunities for debate, such as the overuse of bullet points. And in that paper, I was just trying to remember um, with a colleague earlier, um, where I illuminated the use of um, bullet points as a form of embalming fluid. Uh, you look good, but there ain't much going on. 
Now, few have resisted Trini and Susanna, and I'm thinking here of people like Jeremy Clarkson and Joe Brand. Now, it's hard to do that, though, uh, because what they say is so common sense, so normal. For me, it's the tension between legality and guidance it illustrates this. The profession has been criticised for taking too literally the, the guidance given by successive governments on issues, for example, of the curriculum, as if it was a legal requirement. This is Martha Payne. Martha Payne's a primary school student, and she, uh, she started photographing her school dinners, grading her school dinners, set up a website and a blog, and then used it for philanthropic purposes to generate money to feed um, in Africa. I can't go into the details here, but for me, this speaks to educational administration issues of values, decision-making, workforce issues, everything that that head and um, 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 Bill Taylor was saying in those initial quotes. And I'm quite sure that there must be a ring binder on how to lead and manage your school dinners. However, for me, it read the whole issue of the Martha Payne uh, matter raises two, two issues in our field, particularly um, the place of children. Now, I've done work on this before with Pat Thompson, but Jean Ruddick and Michael Fielding are, are the real leaders are on this area. It seems to me that nobody seems to write about childhood and learning in our field. It seems as if children are the passive beneficiaries of educational administration, and there doesn't seem to be a book on educational administration and children. There are other issues. It seems to me that the demand for data evident in this project, that is the grading of food, the relationship between this as a method and the conditions in which food is produced, the workforce, paying conditions, the per pupil allowance for meals, relates this place of food to wider issues of the relationship between the state, public policy and investment in education. In fact, this plate of food is not actually about food, but is about how in a neoliberal demand for privatisation, working its way into everyday activity. The second one that I think stimulates histories, do we know what that one is? No? Um, uh, Sangata Mitra has put a hole in the wall computer as a means of help helping India's poorest children. He's identified how children can quickly teach themselves the rudiments of computer literacy, and he calls this the concept of minimally invasive education. To test his ideas, he launched uh, his hole-in-the-wall experiment. He took a PC connected to a high-speed data connection and embedded it in a concrete wall next to his company headquarters in New Delhi. He left the computer on, connected to the internet, and allowed the passerbys to do what they would. He monitored activity using a PC on a remote computer and a video camera mounted on a nearby tree. What he discovered was that mo the most avid users of the machine were ghetto kids aged 6 to 12, most of whom have the most rudimentary education and little knowledge of English. Yet within days, they taught themselves to draw on the computer and to browse, browse the net, and is convinced that this is the way forward for education in India. Now, for me, there are uh, important issues here, not least the concept of travelling privatisation and whether or not we will see this idea of a hole-in-the-wall computer travel to England uh, to link into privatisation and austerity. The questions that this generates for me are around matters of integrity. That project that he did would never get through the University of Manchester ethical procedures. Some of the issues are educational, about how children learn. Yes, we all know that children can learn for themselves, but we also know that teachers are important in, rela in relation to how children learn as a group and the importance of questioning. I could go on, but I won't. You're convinced of that argument. Significantly, what it seems to me to say is that the pro approach is probably more about business than it is about education. Children need to be computer literate in order to operate in the marketplace. They need to know how to buy online. They need to be accessed by online advertisers. And there are reports about the lack of equity issues. It seems that women adults who don't access the computer don't seem to matter. He's not interested in them, and I think that that is a crucial point. 
Critical research on trends in education have noted the shift away from education for all, and I don't think this is an example of education for all, but have noted the shift away from education for all to a residualization of the curriculum around basic skills and towards for-profit education. And, and Ron has argued about the issue to do with autonomy being seen as a reward and the importance of a system uh, that we need to be thinking about. Uh, so it seems to me um, that the emphasis has been more on small businesses and business access rather than an education system. And I do think that there are issues about poverty in the UK as an affluent economy. And this is directly linked to our ed admin issues. But currently, there is no book on ed admin and poverty. And there's a need for, to me um, to look at traveling privatizations through history. How do we connect the hole in the wall to LMS, GMS, CTCs, academies, free schools? How do we connect that? There's some historical work and thinking to be done on that. So what kind of histories do we want? So to wind up, um, those two examples I've given around a plate of food and a hole in the wall computer, to me, stimulate some possible areas whereby historical work can be done. The place of children in education and the way in which um, teaching and learning, the profession, the nature of the school and the system of the school um, can be understood. So what kind of histories do we want? Now, this is where I connect with David. I love Downton Abbey. This is an incredible program, very seductive. There's a sense, though, when you watch it, that we're OK now. This is the nostalgia. Uh, a kind of negative nostalgia in a way, that we're all right, you can sit there feeling quite safe and secure because we don't have to live at a time of such social conventions, such a stratified society, and life before penicillin. But we are in danger of seeing the past as a golden age when we watch programmes such as this. We all seems to be settled in a way. People accept their lot if they're downstairs, and if you're upstairs, you've got to recognise your responsibility. There's a sense, though, that things are changing and not always for the better. That's at the heart of the drama. Now, I don't think that we want that type of history, though the more I've thought about it, I think Downton Abbey has to be my next paper regarding the relationship between Downton Abbey and the restructuring of the school system. But there we go. I'll write that on the way back. Um, for me, we don't want that type of histories that make us feel secure and smug. Educational administration in the past was not perfect, and there are deep issues, as Valerie Hall's uh, work shows, um, that continue to run. History is not neutral, it's always in somebody's interests, and we have to recognise that. So how do we do that? And I think Pat and I did it, Pat Thompson and I did it, through Life on Mars that we did at Belmass, a historical note there, a few years ago, and we've written it up. It seems to me that we need metaphors and models for historical analysis um, that don't sedate and don't manipulate, but actually get us thinking. What we asked was, um, what would happen if a head teacher um, would experience if, like Sam Tyler, here on the left-hand side, woke up in 1973 and had to run a school. What would they recognise? What would be different? What might they do that causes trouble? And what might they learn about their role that they could bring back to the present? The paper was provoked by a senior professor in our field declaring at a conference that not much had gone on before the National College. Really? <laughs> The materials we accessed showed the situatedness of debates about comprehensive education, but at the same time, the issues about power and identity that still resonate. I don't have time to do the detail, but there are important points here about how the past is a resource and how we can think about the future. But there's still dangers of golden ageness and nostalgia though I think this has the potential to be more productive. Though I have to say, Downton Abbey does let us realise that capital punishment uh, was and remains cruel and unjust, because Bates would have been hung, though of course we don't know if he did it or not. 
Life on Mars for me generated questions about life before audits, before the Police and Criminal Evidence Act, about how we don't want to go back to a time when scum were arrested because they were scum and the evidence was fitted up. That's the Gene Hunt. At the same time, uh, we don't want to go back to when ed in education when quality issues needed tackling, but they may not have been directly addressed. What Life on Mars does for me is to ask questions about what the issues were at the time, how they were resolved, and for our field, why did we draw on business management, and what happened to debates about democratic renewal. Life on Mars also shows that there are deep-seated social justice issues. It seems that Gene Hunt is a sex figure, and women are swooning at his feet. This seems to support the enduring issue that we women don't really want equality, we just need a good bloke to take us under control. Now, of course, while this is complete tosh, it's in the media reports about the TV series, and I kid you not, read them. In the same way that education, in education, the structural injustices that mean some children do better than others are accepted as enduring. Not least that Owen Jones's book about chavs reports that Chris Woodhead declared that the middle classes do better because they've got better genes. And so Owen Jones's terms, chavs are chavs because they're born that way. And so the 1944 Education Act has clearly been a waste of time. Now, I think those are the kinds of things that we've got to focus on. So to answer my questions, whose histories are we writing? I think we need to recognize the plural, and we need to recognize histories within a diverse society. Who writes these histories? Well, they're open to all, but those of us who do research for a living need to be doing this integral to our teaching and projects. And if the impact agenda is a productive approach, then democratizing these histories through the curriculum is vital. How do we tell those histories? I think through giving recognition of who we are and how we're writing them. Method expertly deployed does not bring neutrality or the truth. How do we interplay the present with the past and the future? With difficulty, but with an eye on what's distinctive about now. And the final point I want to make is that Chakraborty in The Guardian and Andrew Gamble have recently debated the relationship between ideas and action, so crucial to our field. Chakraborty raised the question that social science researchers have not really responded to the banking crisis. Apparently, we've got nothing to say, even though we're paid for by the taxpayer who's been left high and dry. Gamble challenges this and shows how researchers have been active in scoping, understanding, explaining, and providing alternatives. But he argues that researchers cannot be blamed for the failure of politicians to read and engage. It seems to me that, yes, we need to promote historical work in our field, but we do need to understand the politics of knowledge production and the status of historical work within it. So we need historical work to be more than ourselves marketing it. It needs to be activist and political. Thanks very much.